Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Dubai Air Show, where our coverage is sponsored by FLIR Systems. And we're talking to Tony Castilleja, who is uh, with the Boeing organization, with the Starliner program, one of the uh, uh, coolest uh, spacecraft, a key, key, key thing to return Americans uh, to space. You're a systems engineer uh, on the program, yes. uh, veteran of the space shuttle uh, program uh, from the age of 18 onwards for 12 missions, which is spectacular. Uh, went to Rice University, where you uh, studied engineering, yes. uh, got your master's degree as well and, and you're working on the program with Chris Ferguson. Yep. We talked to uh, Captain Ferguson at the uh, Paris Air Show where uh, you, you could see his fingerprints uh, on, on the program and he's, he's very passionate about it. Uh, didn't necessarily deny that he didn't want to make the first man flight uh, on that in the truest tradition of the engineering test pilots that were in Mercury, Apollo, Gemini and also the space shuttle program. Tony, tell us a little bit uh, about, you know, give us a status report on the program as you guys move to first flight in a very ambitious schedule next year. Right, well the Starliner has landed here at Dubai Air Show. We're excited to showcase not only what we do around the world with our airplanes, but also the innovation that we see in human spaceflight and commercial human spaceflight. Behind me you see those fingerprints uh, with the simulator. And what we're doing here at the Air Show is giving everyone the ability to fly the Starliner 10 meters away from space station and docking to the International Space Station. As we continue to build this vehicle, we have three spacecraft in flow being built at the Commercial Crew Processing Facility at Cape Canaveral. And we're looking at first flight uh, third quarter of next year. And so as we work toward that, we are currently training our astronaut crews in Houston, Texas at Johnson Space Center. And then going through all of our flight checks, um, not only on the structural systems and vehicle itself, but also from the human element. And what you see behind me is really a showcase of all of that great engineer's talent and work in building this spacecraft for the future. And uh, that first flight will be on an Atlas uh, V uh, rocket, if I'm not mistaken. Right, this vehicle flies itself with an autonomous vehicle launching from Cape Canaveral on a ULA Atlas V rocket. And so that rocket is already being built in Decatur, Alabama, as that goes through its processing toward the launch pad. And it's going to be really cool to have an Atlas launching, uh, you know, another first, right? I mean, the Atlas going back to uh, its DNA, going back uh, obviously to the to the Mercury program, um, and, and I, I, first generation ICBM as well, or early generation ICBM. Talk to us a little bit, um, you know, as you said, there's, there's going to be a lot of automation that's going to be built into this uh, into this spacecraft. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, in 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 almost every previous generation, astronauts had to do some complex calculations. Orbital dynamics is a, is a right. tyrannical regime mm -hmm. to figure out out where you want to go, you want to whiff or dill, as, uh, as Mike, uh, the legendary uh, Apollo uh, as, and, and Gemini astronaut, Mike Collins would always say, what are some of the systems you guys have put in here to reduce that workload uh, on the astronaut, on the crew, and to make it something that even a regular guy can sit in his seat and with a little bit of tutoring, managed to be able to do something which once upon a time was a very, very significant evolution. That's right, we're at an inflection point of how we train our crews for spaceships like the Starliner system. Um, when we train our astronauts, this vehicle flies itself. We have a variety of VESTA systems and laser systems that are integrated into the vehicle that in reality fly the vehicle itself. The human load is actually extremely limited. In a typical flight scenario, as you launch in about six hours, get to space station, the astronaut is there just in case. And so that really drives our training element to uh, in the event that the human does have to take over the vehicle. So really it is a smooth ride, but more importantly, it opens up the aperture of opportunity for astronauts, not only in the US, but around the world to start flying with us. Now, talk about a little bit about cruise systems uh, and, and ship systems, reliability. You want to make this a reusable spacecraft that can go up to a uh, lot less effort than the space shuttle. Right. Space shuttle was reusable, but there was a lot of rebuilding that had to go on uh, on that. Talk to us from everything from uh, your reentry systems uh, to the internal systems on the spacecraft. So it's not sort of one and done disposable, but you guys can get into a nice rhythm here in terms of launch sequences, which is one of the things you guys want to achieve with the program. Right, as a former space shuttle engineer, we saw it happen with the reflight of, of the orbiters, flight after flight. With the Starliner system, this vehicle will be able to be reused 10 times, and it is a land landing vehicle. Six landing airbags on the bottom of the spacecraft that provide a nice soft landing, um, as comparable to other previous spacecrafts. In the western United States at White Sands is one uh, launch uh, 
and, and landing capability and landing location for us. And so that really provides us the ability for quick access for the crew, but also a quick reuse and quick refurbishment of the vehicle to be able to launch two times, if not more, based on that commercial demand. As you look at this vehicle behind me, uh, we also look at the human element of our spacesuit. Our spacesuit can interact with tablets in the vehicle. That limits the loads of the paperwork that we fly on on orbit for the mission logs, and it allows uh, to start integrating that next generation touchscreen capability into the gloves of our space vehicle. So it's really a 21st century type of space vehicle that integrates the latest in technology, the takes advantage of the miniaturization of a lot of uh, technical software and hardware from the space age and now to this generation. And that, that autonomy, it really drives that ability to train more and more astronauts uh, to be able to fly with us. Um, now, you, when you said, I started laughing a little bit because you said, you know, bring, bring you into a soft landing. Uh, everything is a relative term. Uh, is relative you're you're, space, you're coming but in. Yeah. But talk to us a little bit about the descent velocity and what that last impact is going to be. U.S. program, historically, when we were doing uh, uh, non-reusable spacecraft was sea, uh, ocean landings all the time, whether in the Atlantic or the Pacific. Uh, thankfully, nothing ended up anywhere else that it shouldn't have, uh, even though the spacecraft could handle it. But uh, the Russians have always landed, and they use a retro rocket system, a, a right. dual rocket system, right? A braking rocket as well as, uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about the system you guys are kind of putting on this in order to be able to attenuate the load so that it's not something that is, uh, you know, is within, within a reasonable human load uh, for, for a landing impact. Right, human in loop and human centric. So when we were doing our landing capability, land landing was a key, key component of our infrastructure and, and con ops for the vehicle. Uh, land landing with a reusable, with an outer airbag and an inner airbag, leveraging previous experience from our supplier ILC Dover. Uh, who did the Pathfinder missions of the past for, for Mars uh, vehicles, in this case, providing those airbags on the bottom of the vehicle for a soft landing. Uh, three main parachutes, two drogue chutes as you come through the atmosphere, and then orbital mechanics and really the software driving a pinpoint landing in the western U.S., giving you a pretty much a radius of about four kilometers. It, it really is pinpoint to be able to land on land for our crews to be able to access uh, the astronauts and get them back safely uh, upon landing. Uh, the land landing load, um, it's pretty minimal compared to other vehicles. Uh, you'll see probably a three, maybe four G landing. Um, you probably won't get much above that. Uh, and our testing of all of those systems is currently happening at Langley, uh, at NASA Langley right now. And you can actually go to Boeing.com and see the video of not just a capsule landing, but also the human in the loop and that astronaut uh, representation figuring out the loads and more importantly verifying the loads that we have put into our vehicle since day one. And uh, now I have a, a particularly geeky question to ask you, which is uh, asymmetrical. So the weight distribution on the spacecraft is asymmetrical so that as you rotate, you can use that asymmetrical weight there to steer. There is some capability in that regard. And when you look at our vehicle, you start looking into the internals, the skeleton of the vehicle. Our batteries are in one key section of that vehicle to provide that maneuverability. That's just one way that our systems engineers really optimize the system for that lift over drag coming back through the atmosphere. Um, and you see that in every single component from lighting elements in the vehicle, to the seat configuration, to the touchscreen tablets, everything is optimized to ensure not only uh, safe from launch to landing, but also providing the most efficient solution so that we can take more crew and more cargo to space station. We really need to double the science on that, and the Starliner will do that uh, to support our NASA customer. And, uh, and how many passengers uh, can be supported for how long in the spacecraft? That's right. So, uh, our vehicle seats five. Uh, the NASA requirement is for four NASA crews, of which NASA has already purchased a uh, first flight uh, as we go to the International Space Station. That fifth seat is available not only to uh, the partner countries with the International Space Station, which Boeing would work with in the event of a purchase from those partner countries, but really any country around the world. It is commercial space flight. It's real. And we're working uh, those opportunities worldwide. <laughs> It's come by to Tony's spacecraft shop, a, a spacecraft for five, uh, great range capabilities, and boy, it will be a ride of a lifetime. Tony, thanks right. very much. Best of luck on the program. Hey, thanks for joining us, and come fly with us. Your ride is here. <laughs> We're ready. Well, if that's an invitation I could actually take you up on, that would be totally awesome. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.